So there is a continuum of needs, nutrient needs that we have. Um, when you get a lab test back from LabCorp or from Quest, and you see, and your doctor says to you, oh, you're fine. And you look at that reference range, and you're down here. But it's within the reference range. That is an average of maybe people from eight states who are 35, and most of them are from Minnesota. How does that, how does that equate to you? Um, the example that I like to use here is that deficient, insufficient, OK, optimal. Let's take vitamin D. Vitamin D is one of the most prevalent deficiencies that we have out there. Is it because we're not out in the sun naked anymore? Some of us, okay. Some of you know who you are, who aren't. Um, we, don't, uh, we, we don't go out in the sun without slathering ourselves with SPF 75. Uh, we're wearing clothes. We go from our air-conditioned houses to our air-conditioned cars to our air-conditioned offices, at least in Florida. Uh, and we're, we're getting much lower on that scale. Now, the lab core numbers go from, here, we'll do uh, visuals, 30, 100 lifeguards, you know, those pale, sickly people, lifeguards, 100, 30. So you draw this bell curve, and you're at 32. But your doctor says, you're fine. You're in the reference range. Where do you think you want to be? You want to be right about here, which is anywhere between 65 and 80. So there's a huge difference between 30 and then rickets, uh, lifeguards, and where you are. And the majority of people that we see are somewhere between 15 and 35. 15 and 35. So they're lucky if they're over here. Most of them are over there. OK, now we're going to see how this works. Click. Click. No, oh, that didn't work. There we go. Click. All right, so we're looking at the palm fat, the protein oils, minerals, uh, fat soluble antioxidants, and uh, vitamins. Uh, we also need to know that we have to go the other way. The protein that we take in our body has to go through and do all these things. But we have to make it available by digesting it in, and absorbing it as, a, as amino acids. This is the functional medicine matrix. Now, the information on it was from one person, but this is what a functional medicine doctor will look at. It will look at your story that we retell to you after you give it to us. There are some patients here of mine. And many people, when they get the history, go, it's not two pages, it's 19, 20. And we go through the history from, usually from birth. Do you, and well, I, you don't remember, obviously, but do you know if you were C-section? Do you know if you were vaginally delivered? Were you breastfed? We look at that because then I know whether you've gotten the first gift that your mother gives you, which is your microbiome, your gut bacteria, and colostrum and more microbiome. Um, your genetic history, your predisposing genetics, uh, also part of antecedents. Triggering events. You had that car crash. You weren't really good after that. And then your spouse left with your best friend. And your dog died and the house burnt down. I mean, put a little music, and that's a country western song. Uh, the only thing differentiating is the, the Ford pickup engine that's hanging from a chain from your tree. Um, and then we go down to the mediators, perp uh, perpetuators, uh, hormones, other chemicals in the body, other things you're doing. And we're basically looking at assimilation of the nutrients that you need, uh, defense and repair, energy and metabolism, including mitochondria, biotransformation and elimination, which is the point of this slide. Uh, transport, whether it's lymph, blood flow, communication, that's going to be your hormones, it's going to be your neurotransmitters, and structural integrity, whether it's from, the, uh, from your skin or down to, your, down to your bones. And then the personalized lifestyle factors, which are critical. Uh, sleep and relaxation, exercise and nutrition, stress and resilience and relationships, and then mind, body, spirit, mental, emotional, and spiritual. When someone says it's all in your mind, 
Thank you. I mean, you know, the brain, the brain controls. Ah, uh, yeah, the days of memorization. Your liver detoxifies in a few phases. You take things that are, oh, we use this one, that are lipid soluble and uh, nonpolar toxins, and through the first phase, with uh, what's getting more and more press, and within five, ten years, most physicians will have to have the software, because no one can remember how many, um, of the, the enzymes in your phase one that will deal with the drugs you're taking. People have heard if they've been on chemotherapy, you shouldn't have grapefruit juice because the neuringinin and the grapefruit juice delays the metabolism of the chemo agent so that you only need half, and if you take the grapefruit juice, now you're toxic. So that's, that's phase one. Um, and in that, we're using critical nutrients for oxidation reduction, hydrolysis. Um, this is not vitamin A. It's B2, B3, pyridoxine, B6, folic acid and then branch chain amino acids from proteins, flavonoids, and phospholipids just to take the initial toxins that you've got in your body, whether they are byproducts of metabolism like bile salts or bacterial endotoxins from what's in your gut or things that you are taking, medication, uh, either recreational OTC prescriptions, chemicals in the environment, uh, microbes. All these are toxins that go through your liver. Some are you and some are coming from the outside. What happens is we change it into these intermediaries, which are indeed more toxic. So that if you have the second phase, which is a little bit slow, in order to do these reactions, sulfation, glutathione conjugation, etc., and needing these amino acids, well then you have a buildup of your toxins. So you get sicker. This is my issue with people who go through detox. I'm going to go through a seven-day detox, and I'm going to drink only water and lemons, or I'm going to drink uh, uh, vegetable juice, which is actually better. Detoxification takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of protein energy. And if you don't have the protein when you detox, then yes, you may get here, but you're going to start making uh, the reactive oxygen species, and the, the oxidation. Uh, and then get your secondary tissue damage on your cell membranes. And here's what we need for antioxidant protection, and that's another slide coming up. Eleanor? Yes, you can come up and keep clicking. Click again. Okay. There we go. All right, oils. Well, your cell membranes and your skin made up of um, your, your epithelium, your phospholipids, cholesterol, other things. You do need certain levels of oils and fatty acids in your body. We have multiple chronic, chronic degenerative inflammatory conditions that are amenable for you taking the omega-3 fatty acids as anti-inflammants. All these things we use to help decrease inflammation on a natural level. He was not even a doctor. <laughs> so we'll get to our minerals. Uh, we forget how critical the min minerals are, even though they may be the macros greater than 100 milligrams, and you know this if you're taking calcium, magnesium, you want to take 600, 800, 1,000 uh, milligrams. The microminerals, uh, in some cases, are, are more critically important, like iodine. Iodine is not just for your thyroid. Uh, it's for your prostate. It's for breast tissue. So something as ultra-trace can be more important than some of the, some, than some of the larger ones. Uh, magnesium is required for processing ATP, for energy. Magnesium is in 600 other critical biochemical reactions. It's also the relaxation mineral. Some people will take it orally to go to sleep. Some people will rub magnesium gel for muscle spasms. And some of you will even take an Epsom salt bath of magnesium sulfate. Uh, then we come to zinc, a tongue without zinc, a skin without zinc, a day without sunshine. The critical things that we need here um, and we can tell just by not specialty testing anymore. You can tell by 
uh, alkaline phosphatase in the blood. This is the docs and the other uh, healthcare providers. Low white blood cell, high copper, low vitamin A, uh, beta, uh, beta carotene ratio. All infer that you have a lower zinc than normal. Um, what's critical about that, other than the fact that you may get more colds and there's other skin issues, is that there is a ratio of zinc to copper that has recently been shown to be critical in behavioral disorder, um, OCD, up to and including um, Charlie Manson. 30,000 blood tests were taken over 30 years, Dr. William Walsh, uh, and found that in 88% of the cases, people who had the uh, levels of behavioral disorders, up to and including serial murders, um, had a zinc-copper ratio that was wrong. You should have more zinc than copper. They also had certain heavy metals like lead, mercury, and cadmium, and then some critical nutrient deficiencies. So it's not one thing. It's usually a perfect storm that gives us some of these chronic issues. And now we're looking at the eye for Wilson's disease. If you're a physician or HCP, you know that we used to learn about Kaiser Fleischer rings, uh, issues with uh, excess copper, giving us a multiple sclerotic-like syndrome, protein in the urine as well as blood in the urine. And this is back again to this. Iron, another uh, of our minerals critical for all these cytochrome P450 uh, enzymes that you need to metabolize your toxins. So now we're going to signs of fat-soluble vitamin deficiencies. Other than extra hormones and testosterone when you are 14 years old, um, if you're getting acne and you're 42, there are a few things you have to look at. One is your vitamin A level and then what's in your, in your gut. But these are the other standard ones we see of inflammation of the skin, um, hyperkeratosis uh, follicularis. We look at that on our exam. If you don't have the other um, signs of, these of vitamin A deficiency, then classically it's, it's an essential fatty acid deficiency. You don't need enough fish. Although, now the fish from the Pacific are radioactive. Granted, you can see them at nighttime, but you really shouldn't be eating them. Uh, vitamin D, classic. Um, during our exam, we may be pressing on, the, um, on your anterior tibia or on the joint plate because at four kilograms of pressure, which is what we normally would do to check for the old the old signs of, and symptoms of, of fibromyalgia, people will be tender. So if you bend down and touch, I'm not going to lift my pant leg up. I am going to show you right about here. If you press that decently, and if you're tender, down here, oh, below your knee, about three, four inches, if you find that you are tender to a decent amount of pressure, then you can, you can bet some money that you're probably 30 or below on your vitamin D level. So, Michael Hollick uh, from Harvard, uh, who's coming to speak at UM in, uh, next month, they are, they are increasing the sufficient level of vitamin D now. So it used to be 30 to 100, now it's gonna start at 40. So it's a very simple test. Yes, your doctor do it, I'd like a vitamin D level. Vitamin E and issues with its deficiency, and then vitamin K, most of us know, uh, issues with uh, bleeding. Now, the smart supplement houses have taken to putting the vitamin D with other fat soluble vitamins. So, if you're looking for one of the capsule gel caps or even the liquid that we like to use, because I'm trying to put as many of the critical nutrients that you need that we know you need because we've tested and seen that you are deficient into a shake in the morning. Because, you know, 14 tablets, three times a day, put it in a powder, put it in a liquid, stick it in the shake, drink your shake, and you have what you need for the day. So that's what we're trying to do there. Again, there's more, uh, more signs of vitamin um, A, E, D, and K. ADAC. Fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, K. Everybody else is water-soluble, ADEC. Things that we're seeing with the eyes, night blindness, classic. Um, it may present itself to you that you're driving along at night and that guy in front of you puts on his brights or the glare goes in your eyes. And just for a moment, 
or two or three or four. You can't see. So that's, that may be one of your first signs if, you, uh, if that happens to you at nighttime. You don't immediately accommodate that to the road. And vitamin D, one of my favorites. These are all metabolites of vitamin D. Yeah. Um, we're, not cause, we're not calling it a vitamin anymore. We are calling it a hormone because it's made somewhere else in the body, goes through the bloodstream, and hits other target organs. Every organ, every tissue in your body has a receptor for vitamin D. That's a hormone. It's not a vitamin. It's a hormone. And we basically, vitamin D2, uh, which is the most commonly sold uh, product, is not found in humans. The body will indeed have to convert it in the liver and the kidneys to vitamin D3. Now, it's manufactured commercially by taking or exposing a component of fungal cell membranes or gosterol to ultraviolet light, and then it converts into vitamin uh, D2. Uh, predominant form, again, vitamin D2, and it lasts about two weeks in your body. If you are morbidly obese, and almost no one here is unless you eat a lot of gluten, but that's another story for another lecture, um, it may take a while to get your vitamin D levels up because they sequester into fat. They're fat soluble. But once they're in your fat, uh, they will slowly reach out over the weeks and months to come, and you'll have, uh, you'll have plenty. So let's do some of the physical signs. So yes, if you have pale skin and you have tenderness over the joint plane or, or what we just did, um, you will have some level of insufficiency or deficiency. And I'm looking at deficiency now being below 40. And here's the things that we are seeing with it. Uh, because we use our sunscreen, uh, we live up in Maine, uh, it's winter time, uh, you're on Dilantin or one of the steroids, even St. John's wort, uh, or you're grossly obese. These are some of the conditions that have some input from a lack of vitamin D. Um, I'll give you the big ones that we see. Depression, uh, which is why people in Seattle have those sun boxes that they use in the wintertime to keep from being depressed because they need the sunlight and hopefully they do total body conversion. Um, adult onset diabetes, also now the, the research is showing that if you have sufficient levels of vitamin D, uh, as an infant child, you have a decreased chance of getting insulin-resistant uh, diabetes. Hence my making my little six-month-old grandson, why I didn't make him, uh, me and my daughter give him his drops of vitamin D every single day. Imagine forcing a six-month-old to take uh, vitamin D by drops. Um, we're using a lot now in the autoimmune uh, diseases. Um, some of the functional neurologists, uh, David Perlmutter, uh, who Dr. Kreger mentioned yesterday, is using now anywhere between 20,000 and 40,000 units of vitamin D on a daily basis for his MS patients to decrease their chance of getting, uh, of, of having the, uh, the recrudescence of the disease. We classically will begin people, if they're at 35 or below, at 10,000 units a day for a month, and then 5,000 units a day, and then you must recheck it in three months because that is the time it takes for the vitamin D to equilibrate in your body. Um, those who say, well, you, that's too much, what about your calcium? Because vitamin D classically is important to absorb calcium and phosphorus from the intestine for your bones and for other reasons. I've only seen it once in 20 years where there was too much vitamin D, and that level was 280, not the, not the 100 that we see. And then our antioxidants. Um, vitamin C, CoQ10, uh, aflopoic acid. Here's, this is one of the best markers that you can request to see if you have DNA damage in your body from uh, free radicals from reactive oxygen species. And it's called 8-OHDG, or if you want to be cool about it, it's 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine, otherwise known as 8-OHDG. Um, Critical, and that's another test that you can get from a simple lab. And now we're going to get to some uh, photos oh, and of the mitochondria. Critical CoQ10, um, 
It's in another lecture, but I'll mention it. The reason why uh, statin drugs have a bad rep, uh, for a good reason, is that in the pathway that decreases cholesterol in the body, uh, it also decreases CoQ10. So that without the CoQ10, your mitochondria do not have the critical antioxidant uh, for the electron transport chain to make energy. Uh, if that occurs in your muscles, then you have weak muscles or sore muscles or tired muscles. The number one reason why people on their own stop their statin drugs. If it happens to be in your heart, which is a muscle, and there's congestive heart failure, that's the reason why uh, one of the statin drugs is taken off the market because of the dozens and dozens and dozens of people who died from congestive heart failure because the statin drug wiped out the CoQ10 and they couldn't make energy in their muscle. Uh, historically, um, Merck, Sharp, and Dome that made the first statin drug made it with CoQ10 because they knew if you didn't have the CoQ10, you would have all these other issues. And corporate America being what that is, they sold the patent to that separately to a foreign company who now makes the CoQ10 for the world. So if you, don't, if you are on your statin drug because it is appropriate for you, you've had a heart attack, uh, you have a family history of it, and your cholesterol is 480, then, then yes, you can take the statin drug with the CoQ10. Uh, statin drugs work because they're anti-inflammatory. But again, so are essential fatty acids, so are, I mean, from walnuts. Um, so is curcumin, turmeric. These are all uh, anti-inflammatories. All right, I'll get off my soap opera on that. Niacin. Vitamin B, B3. We learned this in medical school. I know you remember this from the citric acid cycle, the Krebs cycle, not the main RG Krebs cycle, the Krebs cycle, and to, to make energy. It's also critical in electron transport to make ATP. So this B vitamin, and for the joining of DNA strands, you think that's important? So that your DNA joins together? All from, all from niacin. And now we get some of the disgusting pictures. So this is deficiency in niacin. Classically, uh, it is, um, it's seen in, in not the United States and Western civilization, but you will see it still in alcoholics. And it presents with this uh, photo distributed rash, anything that's exposed to, to sunlight. And it gives you these GI symptoms, you can actually uh, also present with esophageal carcinoma that was mentioned, and neuropsychiatric disturbances. Dr. Abram Hoffer, back in the 60s, was effectively treating schizophrenia with niacin, and then his office was burnt down. And little pills were scattered all over the place. No, that's not true. Um, it used to be called uh, Mal de la Rosa in 1726. They had no idea what it was. And then somebody in Italy renamed it uh, Pelagra from Peleagra, which is rough skin. And then it was confirmed uh, by uh, Dr. Goldberg in 1926 that this crusty skin lesion was due just because you didn't have enough vitamin B3. Uh, B vitamins and methylation status. So in the past few years, we have been done doing more and more and more genetic testing, single nucleotide polymorphism testing. And the big one out there now is um, methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase, which somebody named the enzyme and somebody named the mutation the same name. Um, we call it, well, it's MTHFR, so it's either Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, or if you're not in mixed company, mother fur. But the MTHFR um, genetic mutation is critical for some people. FDA, for many, 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 many years, refused to allow us to tell you, just like Dr. Craig was telling you, we're not allowed to tell the truth, um, that if mothers did not have folic acid, then there was a greater risk of their children having issues. Neural tube defects, spina bifida, the cleft palate, etc. So we started making sure that everyone was taking a prenatal vitamin if they were even considering getting pregnant or if they were on birth control pills to be off for six months because birth control pills, as you'll see in another lecture, wipe out your B vitamins. So it took that amount of time to, to get a sufficient level of them in you. And now we know that some people who are taking folic acid have this genetic mutation where they don't convert 
folic acid to the active folate that you need to do all these things. And all these things uh, include lowering homocysteine, uh, which is an inflammatory amino acid that has been arguably associated with uh, cardiovascular disease, stroke, etc. And the higher your homocysteine, the greater that risk is. But the homocysteine is a window into the soul of the methylation cycle, which we're going to get to right there. Um, this cycle makes third-year medical students cry. I mean, I'm tearing up just looking at it. But what, what, what you're looking at is that from this MTHFR uh, and the folate cycle, you are looking at issues with increasing cancer, and I think Dr. Greger mentioned about methionine, if you were here for that, um, cardiovascular issues, uh, depression, anxiety, schizophrenia. This is from one of the other MTHFR alleles. This is from the A1298, 1298A allele, that if you have this mutation, you don't uh, break down, metabolize, the neurotransmitters in your brain as well as other people. So you may have increased circulating levels of norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine. Um, it also tends to decrease metabolism of estrogen so that you have higher estrogen uh, circulating. Well, we have enough estrogen in the world. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it that way. We have enough estrogen. No, that's not for me. We have enough estrogen in the xenoestrogens in the environment, in the bisphenol A plastic bottles that you drink from, in the hormone-rich uh, foods that people eat. Thank you. So we need to improve our game, and this is where we're getting now. There is a new uh, diagnosis out there, but it's not for you. It's for the medical community, and that new diagnosis is called hyposkilia, low skills. And physicians in the room, if, you, if they have been in an ER in the past five or 10 years, will tell you that what's changed? I mean, didn't we used to get trained like differently, more, better, something else? So um, there have been study after study after study after, oh, that's, that's, uh, birth, death, bed, bedside to lock homes, loss of move a foot to not teach it at all because of our technology. A patient comes in with a chief complaint and at some point in that workup you're getting a CAT scan or an MRI. But somebody did not put hands on you and see what you had that could have been prevented by eating differently or hydrating or moving or going in the sunshine or not being uh, uh, depressed because something happened. Um, it's a shame, but what we're looking at is um, classically we're finding that these, uh, these students actually can't take an adequate medical history, they can't perform a reliable physical exam, uh, they're not critically assessing the information that they even gather, uh, they can't create a sound management plan and they communicate poorly. When I graduated medical school, the head of a hospital who was the chief of medicine was my landlord. And um, yeah, that's interesting, right? He was my landlord. But I got rides into the hospital with him. Um, and I had graduated early, because that's what I did. I graduated. I was going to travel the world. He goes, no, 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 no. You're not a doctor yet. I said, yes, I am. I have this degree. He said, no, you're a medical student that graduated. If you want to go out, spend the next six months with me before your internship, and I'll make you a doctor. I said, yes. And for six months, this guy taught me the physical, physical exam techniques that he learned from a 70-year-old doctor 50 years before that learned it from somebody else. So the, the exams he, he was showing me were from somewhere around 1920. And I had never learned this in medical school in our clinical exam class. And at the end of the six months, he took me to the hospital that at that time had a ward. Some of you remember wards? You have 50 people in it. And there was a woman in the corner, and he said, okay, I want you to go over and tell me what she's here for. And I went to go over, and he goes, well, I'd like you to do it from here. He said, you can ask questions and just look at her, and I'll answer the questions. And her feet were hanging over the bed. I said, well, she's taller than six feet tall. He goes, yeah, she's 6'4". 
and her head was bobbing up and down. So I put my hand on my pulse, and her head was bobbing up and down to a pulse. For those of you who are doctors, and I said, aortic regurgitation? He goes, aortic regurgitation. Six foot four. She's got sunglasses on. Inside, in the corner. I said, does she have Marfan syndrome like Lincoln did? She's here because she detached her retina? He goes, now you're a doctor. You didn't do a blood test, you didn't do a CAT scan, you didn't do anything. And that gave me chills at the time, and that's, that's when I started doing more, more of these things. So, this is what we just went through. Now, the, the problem with uh, trying to communicate the need for a good clinical exam was that sometimes the physical exam is outdated and perhaps best, perhaps best to card, discard it. That may be with when you're looking at your, at your nails um, and if you're percussing someone for up and down of the diaphragm. Other times it's accurate, probably not used as much as it should be used. Uh, that murmur, um, palpating that gallbladder, things that we still do today. And still other times, the murmur of mitral valve, hemiparesis for a stroke. All right, quick test. Someone you're with or someone you see collapsed to the ground. People don't know what they had and they're making noise. Did they have a heart attack? Did they have a stroke? Everybody put both your arms up. Now stick your tongue out. If it's in the middle and your arms are up, congratulations, you have not had a stroke. That's as easy as it is. There are things you, you, that you have to know that, that are excellent like that. So. And for still others, the comparison is impossible because clinical studies do not exist, and they will never exist. Those clinical studies will just never exist. Uh, the arguments going on even right now, can technology replace the, uh, the clinical exam? And contrary to what the technologists are telling us, um, unknown malignancies were diagnosed in autopsy back in 1923, a little bit less than 40% of the time. Someone died, you did an autopsy, and you said, oh, they died from cancer. Well, that's 41% in 1972. That hasn't really changed. It's gone up, actually, with all our technology. And 44% in 1998. Um, we had another study of almost 200 patients who died during the stay in the ICU, in the intensive care unit. And the autopsies uncovered major diagnostic errors in a third of the patients, despite extensive testing by multi-million dollar equipment. Uh, 14 of those people um, who used the imaging, they were noted to contribute to their misdiagnosis. Uh, the doctors who used some of the equipment missed endocarditis in nine patients, despite ordering the echocardiogram, and three patients were diagnosed with it and they didn't have it. Uh, this is an issue because with a good history, it's a 1% error, and with a good physical exam, it's only a 2% error. And they want us to move away from that and use technology. So that's an ongoing fight with us. All right, so let's move. Okay. Nutritional physical exam. Things that we normally use that I don't have, but physicians who signed in for CME do have their uh, scratch and sniff card. Now, when we do vitals, uh, we do standard vitals. We also do an ECG if you're over 40. We do um, waist to hip ratio now. We hadn't done it before. And we do bioelectrical impedance analysis. BMI no longer works if you're short or if you're tall with muscles or short with muscles. Well, what if you're a dwarf and you're muscular? BMI is not accurate. So we use a BIA, which is just shooting electricity through you. Um, because water conducts electricity faster, you have extracellular water, intracellular water, uh, 45 and 55 percent of your body, um, bone and fat, they all conduct electricity differently. The phase angle we're looking at, the more your phase angle, the more body muscle mass you have, and actually future morbidity and mortality directly correlate with the higher uh, phase angle that you have on a, on a biopedes assessment. So when I have that 45-year-old who has a phase angle of 10.2 like I had last week, and then the 22-year-old who has a phase angle of 4, 
we have, we have issues. And then when you go through the history and physical, you see that it is exactly uh, tagging it, exactly. So here's our, here's our women. You have gynoid, where you look like a pear. Pears are beautiful. And then you have the android, who is uh, an angel. Uh, you look like an apple. So what we can tell from this is go back and we'll uh, we're looking at waist hip ratio. Actually, more uh, more accurate for future cardiovascular uh, events than we than we ever thought. But when I see somebody like this, who may be overweight, over fat, visceral adipose tissue, over fat, I'm looking more at inflammatory fat on the hips, whether it's endocrine, um, hypothalamic, pituitary, adrenal, thyroid, gonadal. Uh, remember, once you have some endocrine thing going on here, you need to look at the others. Uh, if you have subclinical hypothyroidism, because you're not converting your inactive T4 thyroxine hormone to active T3, you have to look at the adrenal glands, because the adrenal glands help convert that. It may not be that you're deficient in selenium, iodine, B6, iron, that helps with that conversion. It may not be that you're deficient in tyrosine, the basic amino acid that get, converts into, uh, into the thyroxine and then to dopamine. It may just be that we do have the, uh, the biotransformation issues like we saw in the, uh, in the liver phase, uh, dysbiosis or SIBO, we're doing that in the gut lecture. So if an antibiotic is against life and a probiotic is for life, what do you think dysbiosis is? Screwed up life and that's in your gut. It is more an imbalance of the bacteria and yeasts and things that you have inside of you. And then small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. How many people here bloat, feel bloated after they eat? Not a lot, that's the vegan lifestyle. But uh, the people I see, classically, will feel bloated after they eat. That's why they self-select and come to me. Uh, if, you, if you have people that bloat within that half hour after they eat, classically, that is because of a lack of hydrochloric acid. And then those people have been on over-the-counter purple pills for years and years and years. Um, if it